everybody. Once again, I'm so happy that you chose to join us on our Mount Sinai MBC of Memphis YouTube channel. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again, we say thank you for hearts and minds to study your word. Father, we ask, as always, that you would open our hearts and minds as we receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still studying the article number 13, A Gospel Church. And our author writes, we believe that a visible church of Christ is a congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the ordinances of Christ, governed by his laws, and exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, that its only scriptural officers are bishops, pastors, and deacons whose qualifications, claims, and duties are defined in the epistle to Timothy and Titus. And so today, we move to a new set of scripture. Uh, we leave the church that was in Corinth and all of its problems and look at the early church. And for that, we go to the book of Acts. And our focus will be on Acts, the second chapter, verses 41 and 42. And I will be reading out of the King James Version. It says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there was added, unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So the early church starts on the day of Pentecost, which was 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. The Holy Spirit came uh, upon the believers during the Feast of Pentecost, which is also called the Feast of Weeks. It was one of the three annual feasts that all the Jewish males were required to travel to the temple in Jerusalem to appear before the Lord. Thus, on the day of Pentecost, the city of Jerusalem was filled with folk from all over. It is a must to talk about the day of Pentecost when starting a lesson about the early church. It was celebrated 50 days after Passover. And as is common in the Bible, there is there was also known by it was also known by other names. Uh, that is one of those things that sometimes confuses us and requires diligent study when the Bible refers to the same thing in different names. For instance, Jacob is also called Israel. Then when the 12 tribes of Israel split, 10 tribes made up the northern kingdom and two tribes made up the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was also or is also called Israel and sometimes referred to as Ephraim. The southern kingdom was also called Judah. And so hopefully you get my point that there are situations in the Bible where more a thing is referred to by more than one name, and which is uh, the day of Pentecost. That was, the, that was the case. It was also known as the day of fr first fruit uh, or the feast of weeks or the feast of the harvest. And so, of course, in the book of Acts, the day of Pentecost is the most notable. It, it, it opens uh, by the second chapter, um, the day of Pentecost. It, it was a day of celebration. Uh, the people would abundantly, it was a day of praising God and giving him thanks and and they were thankful for the harvest of the fields. They were thankful for the great exodus from Egypt. And they were giving, they were thankful for the giving of the law uh, on Mount Sinai. And all of that was fulfilled in the coming of the Holy Spirit. When Pentecost was fully come, the first fruit was born. 
which was the church, and the first harvest, which were the souls that were saved. So Jesus had told the disciples to tarry or to wait in Jerusalem until they were endowed with power from on high. In, in essence, they were not to do anything until they received power. And, and I think sometimes when we read that, we forget that that was not an easy order to, to obey. You remember the disciples witnessed Jesus' ascension on the Mount of Olives. Then they were told to, I mean, after that, they obeyed Christ by returning to Jerusalem. And it took tremendous courage because Jerusalem was the center of opposition against Christ. And them being followers of Christ made them targets. But once again, we see the difference in the disciples after seeing the resurrection of Christ. They, in essence, had gone from being fearful to fearless. And, and so even though they were risking their lives, which you will see throughout the remainder of the New Testament, that's what, that's what they did. But they had committed their lives to obeying Jesus Christ and whatever the consequences were. It's like they, uh, their thing was to obey and leave the consequences up to God. So they were in one place. Unlike on the first day of the week, remember when Jesus arose from the dead, he had told them that he would meet them. But out of fear, they were all over the place. But this time, they were where they were supposed to be, waiting for the power from on high. And then in Acts, the second chapter, verses 1 through 2, and this is the King James Version, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting so they were obedient and they were with one accord and they had a spirit of expectancy and even though they had been prepared for the coming of the holy spirit remember the prophet joel prophesied it john the baptist said it jesus taught it in the upper room, Jesus identified the Holy Spirit as a person. And then after his resurrection from the dead, Jesus appeared to them in the upper room and breathed on them saying, receive ye the Holy Spirit. But they had to wait. My point is that even though they were prepared for his coming, they didn't know when he would come. The Bible says in Acts 2 and 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting so 10 days after jesus ascension and them praying the holy spirit came upon them and filled the whole body of believers have you ever stopped to think about the wonder of the whole event and how different it was from when God gave the law at Mount Sinai, which was terrifying to the people. So much so that they begged Moses to ask God to stop. It's like, Moses, tell God to stop and you talk to us. We don't want God to talk to us. But here, even though the arrival of the Holy Spirit came in a God-given production, People were amazed and not afraid. God was ushering in the church. Unlike the giving of the law, mercy and grace would be there. And God wanted us to not be afraid of the Holy Spirit. But he did want us to be aware, to take notice, to be obedient. You know, the Bible says that all of a sudden there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind it was sudden the the holy spirit came abruptly unexpected it, it's as though i don't know if you remember you know back in school when they would tell you uh we will have a fire alarm uh today 
And, and, and so you knew it was coming, but you didn't know when. And, and so, and so when it, when it actually happened, uh, you were still jolted, even though you expected it. That was God's production. It's like, even though they expected it, uh, when it happened, they were still startled. They were still jolted. This was, you know, God's production from heaven, and it, and it was not a natural occurrence. Note the Bible says it was the sound of a mighty rushing wind, not an actual wind. The sound like the wind of a hurricane, but no actual wind. And, and everybody heard it. The sound filled all the house. And then in verse three, it says, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Think about that. First, you have this jolt by a sound of a mighty rushing wind that you don't see any wind. There's no wind. And the sound filled the house. So it was a loud sound. Then in my mind, while the people are hearing the noise, but it's not producing wind, then appear cloven tongues as of fire. One commentary said that the cloven tongues in the Greek means a tongue that was cloven or parting. Uh, the idea is that a single tongue appeared and then began to split and divide itself, resting upon the disciples. The tongue only looked like fire. They were not fire. They, they were brilliant, luminous, fire-like substances created by God to dramatize the moment of the Holy Spirit coming. It was a production made by God, and, and, and its intent was to get the attention of all that was there. And, and so, and it did. Then after that, the disciples began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Spirit came in a mighty way so that you couldn't help but notice it. And note that they were speaking in other tongues. They were not speaking gibberish. They were speaking in languages so that everybody in Jerusalem could understand the message. Remember, Jerusalem was filled with men of all regions were there because to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And God was making sure that the power of the Holy Spirit, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that they would hear and understand the gospel in their native language. Now, note that when the people on the inside saw all of this, they were not afraid. They were amazed. So much so that they went outside and started telling. They started witnessing, telling folk what they had heard, seen and heard. Then those who had been hanging outside came inside to hear for themselves, and they too were amazed. Look at the Holy Spirit moving through the witnessing of those first believers being amazed. Then their amazement spread to others who themselves were amazed, and before long the place was filled, which was the audience needed for Peter's first sermon. The question has to be asked, when was the last time you or I were moved to the point of amazement by the Holy Spirit? So much so that we went beyond our four walls and actually told somebody about the activity of the Holy Spirit with such excitement, with such amazement that it caused them to come inside to check it out for themselves. The early church didn't have the things that we think are so essential for a successful church. They didn't have the elaborate buildings, the cathedrals. The, they didn't have all of that. They didn't have the money. They didn't have the political influence. They didn't have the social status. And yet the church won multitudes to Christ and saw many churches established throughout the Roman world. That tells me 
that it was not in the stuff. It was not in the, the elaborate buildings. It was not in the money. It was not in the, the, the dress, the facade that we put up. That was not the stuff used to draw people. The power then, as is now, was in the power of the Holy Spirit energizing its ministry. They were people who were set on fire by the Spirit of God. Can you imagine how different not only our churches would be, but also our world? If we as believers were set on fire by the Spirit of God, and he's still in the business, he's still, he's still setting people on fire, he's still waiting for us to want to be set on fire. Come back next week as we look at the early church and its characteristics, how they were really, you, you know, we talk about it like we're on fire for Jesus. You know, that's just kind of one of our things that we say. But they were really on fire for Jesus. So come back next week as we continue to look at the early church and its characteristics to possibly pick up on some tips, some ideas of how the same thing can happen for us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Until then, take care, be blessed, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.